Last year, I did a video about the state of Apple, the products they were offering, how they fared against the competition, and how I expected them to perform into the future. Today, we're going to take a look back and see what Apple has improved in the last 12 months. We'll also look and see what still doesn't really make sense in their lineup and what they should do to fix it. Let's start with the Mac because holy smokes, this has been a big year for the Mac. When I published my video in 2020, the ARM transition had not yet been announced. And while it had been rumored to be upcoming, a lot of people, myself included, were surprised to see at how soon it arrived. Now, to date, we still only have one Apple Silicon chip, the M1. And while that chip is found in three different computers, the 13-inch MacBook Pro, 13-inch MacBook Air, and Mac Mini, the machines are closer than ever before in both price and performance. Now, the Mac Mini regains its crown as the perfect entry-level Mac for those that already have a monitor, mouse, and keyboard. And the two laptops? Well, they're basically the same computer. In fact, I had ordered a loaded 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro originally, but found myself gravitating towards the base model M1 MacBook Air that I had purchased for my wife, the one that she rejected in favor of my old i9 15-inch MacBook Pro. But I laugh because for normal people who don't need tons of sustained compute power, like her, the MacBook Air is perfect. The insane power efficiency provides for superb battery life, uh, more than adequate processing power, by the way, when called for, and in a price and package that's rather accessible. Now, last year when people asked me, well, Quinn, what Mac should I buy? I would respond by saying, well, it depends, and then inquiring about their compute work. And now I just say, M1 MacBook Air. It's excellent. Now, there are rumors of an impeding 14-inch MacBook Pro with an updated processor, and I really think that that thing needs to come. Because the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro, it just it doesn't need to exist. Uh, only under extenuating circumstances can you get the air to throttle, and even then, the differences are so minimal as to not really matter. For those that do need additional headroom, a slightly larger display on the same size chassis with a faster chip would serve them much better than the 13-inch MacBook Pro. So let's talk about that faster chip because a lot of people wonder, well, where do we go from here? This may be a slight oversimplification, but Apple really has two options. Number one, increase density, or number two, increase die size. By shrinking their process to three nanometers from five nanometers, Apple could make for faster chips within the same power envelope as current M1 machines. But that would also warrant an M2 second generation chip of sorts. And I don't think that Taiwan Semiconductor nor Apple will be ready to produce new silicon at scale before the beginning of 2022 at the earliest, if rumors are to be believed. Believed. <laughs> Furthermore, this likely wouldn't give Apple enough wiggle room to finish the transition from Intel to ARM within the two-year window that they promised us last year. So that leaves us really only the second option. And the good thing is that's the option that frankly makes more sense if Apple is to stick to the idea that larger, more expensive computers have increased performance. And that is, well, just make bigger, hotter, faster chips. The good thing about the current M1 is that because it is so insanely efficient, it can be scaled up just fine, even in an ultrabook form factor. And the rumored M1X, it actually makes a lot of sense to me. Instead of the four high power cores in the M1, Apple would opt for double that while retaining the existing four efficiency cores, making it a 12 core CPU. This would provide significant real world benefits because again, they're doubling the high end cores and it would put it at the top of the laptop SKU performance charts and actually really high up on the desktop leaderboards as well. All of that with a fraction of the power consumed. There's also a rumor that Apple would basically carbon copy the existing onboard eight core graphics chip into a 16 core variant. Now we discussed in our overview of the M1 hardware that the GPU was very respectable for an onboard graphics chip, best in class in fact, but that the competition also isn't particularly fierce. To provide some comparative perspective, the two-year-old NVIDIA 1650 handily slaps the M1's GPU, and that chip can be found in laptops that cost less than $700. 
So a core doubled M1X GPU could provide similar performance to entry level laptop gaming GPUs, but uh, one could also just as successfully argue that Apple has, well, no interest in gaming and that their hardware optimized metal processes would derive greater real world performance than those other cards. And that's actually likely true. That's also what we call a run on sentence, folks. <laughs> so let's zoom back and look at the lineup as a whole. We've got the M1 Mac Mini, a great computer if a bit large in form factor. The M1 MacBook Air, a best in class all round Apple computer and pretty much one of the best computers Apple has ever made. And then the 13 inch MacBook Pro, a computer that seems it will die and reincarnate as a faster M1X 14 inch MacBook Pro. So then that leaves the 16 inch MacBook Pro and yeah, it too should get an upgrade. But if Apple merely slaps in the same M1X chip that's in the 14 inch MacBook Pro, we have yet another product standoff, two computers that are basically the same. Now, sure, the screen sizes are fairly different and I have no doubt that Apple on the base configuration of the 16 inch MacBook Pro would offer just an M1X. But the largest MacBook Pro has always been the graphics powerhouse and compute king in Apple's portable lineup. And I have to hope for something at least a little special. Now, the easy thing to do would entail slapping an off the shelf AMD graphics compute chip inside the MacBook Pro and <laughs> boom, done. In fact, many people have suggested this is likely what will happen. I, however, find myself in the skeptics camp because the current ARM64 build of Mac OS has stripped itself of all AMD graphics drivers. And while sure, Apple could easily add those back in, the whole point of this transition beyond making better computers is control and vertical integration. Apple doesn't want to rely on anyone. And look, they have to do something for their highest end desktop Macs. So I would also expect that they do the same for their beefy laptops. Here's hoping. I'm also going to make the prediction that one or both of these pro laptops will introduce mini LED screens that Apple has been working on and off with since 2014. Never did I expect my biggest complaint about a Mac to be the display, but it is now and new display tech would make me a very happy camper. Now let's quickly talk desktop Macs, the iMac and Mac Pro. The iMac Pro is well dead and I don't expect it to come back. I think that the iMac will launch as it typically does with all configurations, a low end M1 model with a new beautiful design and fantastic display and a tolerable price tag, as well as a super high end M1X or M1Z model with the highest end compute and graphics chips and with the same beautiful display, new design and less tolerable pricing. As for the Mac Pro, I don't think we're gonna see anything happen with that this year at all. Rumors are still all over the place. And since pros are the slowest to move to new architectures and an M1 Mac Pro will also be the hardest computer for Apple to make, that's obviously coming last. This video is sponsored by Roborock and they are not a new sponsor to the channel. I have been a longtime fan of their excellent robot vacuums and their newest Roborock S7 is no exception. Of course, you can anticipate all the niceties that you've come to expect, like LiDAR navigation that allows for excellent location and object awareness, multi-floor mapping support, and insanely powerful suction that picks up even the largest of debris. However, the S7 welcomes some fun new features I've really come to like from my prior model. Look, robot vacuums are generally pretty awful at mopping. It's usually just a pad they drag around the floor and it just doesn't work. But the S7's new sonic mopping tech flips that adage on its head. Since the pad actually vibrates at up to 3000 times per second, it scrubs and the vacuum even has the option to drive in a pattern conducive to heavy duty mopping. It, it genuinely works surprisingly well. And even better, you no longer have to hassle with scheduling because the S7 intelligently lifts up the pad from the floor when it detects carpet or docks. This is largely thanks to the S7's new ultrasonic carpet sensors that work extraordinarily well. The vacuum even shows up in the app where it identifies carpets and rugs that you can set as restricted no-go zones if desired. Gone is the old bristle brush and in comes a new rubber one. On hardwood floors, it works way better than the old designs and on carpet, it seems to perform just as well as the old one. Say goodbye to hair tangles and quickly worn brushes. These are just a few of the Roborock S7's excellent features. Be sure to check it out via the link below and purchase yours today to support the channel. Okay, we've delayed talking about it long enough. The cash cow, the one, the only iPhone 12. Look, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings here, but the iPhone 12 was really boring.
The flagship feature of this year's phones was a new design. And sure, okay, it's new, I guess. Let me put it this way. I had to send my iPhone 12 Pro I was using in for repair a couple months back, and I reverted back to an iPhone 11 Pro for about a week. Ask me if I noticed the difference. Ask, ask me. Okay, fine, don't. Well, I didn't notice the difference. <laughs> LiDAR on the Pro phones is basically worthless, save for a very narrow few AR apps and the occasional improvements you'll notice in nighttime portrait mode. But beyond that, it's a pretty minor phone update. That is, unless you're me and you bought the iPhone 12 mini. This phone is an absolute delight. And you know what? I was one of the first onto the big phone trends with the Dell Street back in 2010, and I have owned many a monster phone since. But here's the thing about the Mini. Once you use it for a few weeks, it just it feels like the right size. It doesn't feel Mini anymore. I can reach everything with one hand. I can type one-handed. I don't have to ham fist it when I'm taking a photo in landscape mode. It's just excellent. There's really, and as far as I'm concerned, only one major downside. The battery is supremely <laughs> meh. Now on the flip side, it charges very quickly because the battery's so small, but I'm generally really lucky to make it to dinner before I enter the red zone on the battery indicator. Unfortunately, apparently nobody seems to be buying these things. And that's a real shame because I love this phone and think it's one of the best Apple has ever made. I hope they don't kill them. Now for 2021, reliable leaker Mark Gurman says that it's going to be an S year. I mean, it'll probably be called iPhone 13, but beyond perhaps a shrunken notch and maybe, maybe an in-screen display fingerprint reader, I don't think we're gonna see much this year. That said, I would kill for a fingerprint sensor, even one integrated in the power button like many Android devices and the iPad Air. In mask times, which I don't think are going away anytime soon, it would be handy for sure. Now, onto the Apple Watch. What do I really need to say? Look, I'm not a smartwatch guy. I've never been a smartwatch guy and nothing Apple could do would make me become a smartwatch guy. However, I recognize how much people love it. And Apple's continued integration with health and fitness apps are just pure money. I've participated alongside my wife in a few fitness plus routines and they're actually a lot of fun even though I don't get the rings to brag about it. Now, while the software stack continues to improve, Year over year, the hardware improvements are actually very minimal. Marco Arment, the developer of the Overcast podcast app, shared some interesting statistics with me. As you can see, newer Apple Watch models, well, they don't seem to have as much uptake as you'd expect. And Marco told me that his users actually skew higher end than average based on other developers he's talked to. So the question is, well, why the lack of upgrades? I'd probably mark it down as the fact that new models typically only offer maybe one additional health sensor. And at the price of a new watch, these things aren't cheap. I don't blame people going a few years in between upgrades. Unsurprisingly, Apple Watch SE has not been adopted well at all. I don't know what Apple expected given its emaciated feature set and stupidly high price tag when last gen clearance models are on sale for less money with more features. But with that said, the sustained popularity of Series 3 really has been frustrating for watch developers because they still use the old screen size. So here's hoping that the SE gets a new life later this year with a much lower price tag and maybe some of the sensors that people want, at least enough to encourage people to move over from Series 3. Apple Watch is not a bad product, quite the opposite, in fact. However, if Apple wants more people to buy and rebuy, they're going to have to make a bigger generational jump than they've been making. In general form factor, the watch appears the same as it did when it was introduced. Maybe that's in the cards though, as Ming-Chi Kuo, renowned Apple leaker, said that the 2021 watch will get a improved form factor design, whatever that means. AirPods, if you told me five years ago that I would become a fan of Apple's entire wireless headphone lineup and that I would listen to them more than any other pair of headphones, I'd have probably laughed in your face. But here we are. At the moment, we've got three AirPods models, the 2019 iteration of the OG AirPods born in 2016, the 2019 AirPods Pro, and the newest 2020 AirPods Max. Starting newest to oldest, AirPods Max are perfectly fine headphones. If you haven't seen my overly thorough review, be sure to check that out. I really liked the AirPods Max. Their sound quality, their noise cancellation and transparency modes, everything was top notch, except for the comfort, which was suitable. 
but I have a few gripes a few months into ownership. Number one, charging via Lightning is absolutely stupid. These need to have shipped with USB-C support. I never have Lightning cables around anymore because of MagSafe and Qi charging. And trying to hunt for a Lightning cable every time I need to charge these, it is the worst. Secondly, up until probably a week ago, I was getting the worst and most annoying battery drain ever. Even inside the dumb little case, I would wake up in the morning after a single light day of use and they would have gone from 100% to 100% dead. A new firmware update seems to have fixed this, but I'm now getting less consistent handoff in between my devices. They need to continue ironing out bugs, but ultimately, I hope that Apple makes a less premium version of these headphones. Uh, keep the same drivers, but then cheap out on everything else. Go with a lighter, less uh, clacky, more comfortable composite plastic build quality and call it a day. They would be fantastic. To contrast that, AirPods Pro remain probably my favorite Apple product in the last five years. They are absolutely superb. They sound great, their comfort is top notch, at least for me. Their battery life continues to be excellent a year and a half down the road. They survived a wash through the washing machine. <laughs> their noise cancellation and transparency modes are very good. Their range is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it is just hard to express in words how much I love these things. And honestly, I don't really know what Apple would do for a second generation. Uh, maybe improved transparency mode like on the AirPods Max? I don't know, but that hasn't stopped a bunch of leakers from claiming new AirPods Pro are coming later this year or early next year. But as to what they'll bring, well, there's not really any consensus. My advice, buy them if you haven't already. Oh, and then we get to the original AirPods. Now, there are some for whom the AirPods Pro are not ideal. Either they don't fit very well, or the silicone seal is uncomfortable, or the higher price tag is a turnoff. I get it. Rest assured, help is on the way, dear. Help is on the way, dear! We now have what seem to be pretty compelling leaked images of the upcoming AirPods 3. They've ditched the original long stem design in favor of something a little more reminiscent of AirPods Pro. Uh, gone is that earlobe slam that will be required to pause and skip tracks, thank goodness, and adopted will be the more elegant pressure sensor inside the stem. Also absent would be the noise canceling because of the lacking silicone tips, but present would be improved battery, uh, better connectivity, and of course, a better transparency mode. Now, if I could have one wish list item for both these and the AirPods Pro, it would be something that probably most of us wish for, replaceable batteries. Now look, I, I don't see why Apple couldn't have a twist off stem that they could sell separately that would house a battery and microphone replacement assembly. It may marginally increase the size, sure, but it would be so awesome to simply perform an easy DIY repair instead of just accept the fact that we need to fuse these batteries in too deeply into the headphones that are completely unreplaceable without destroying an otherwise perfectly good set of earbuds. I mean, come on. A lot of original AirPods owners are claiming that they can't get more than 15 to 20 minutes on a charge, which is a huge bummer because they otherwise still work perfectly. These are only two to three year products, and that is unfortunate, not just for our wallets, but for the environment as well. Okay, now let's get into AirTags. Actually, let's not, because we've already been running long, and frankly, I don't know what to say about AirTags other than one, I feel like they've been rumored so long that they've already been out and I've forgotten about them, and two, why is this the market that Apple has felt the need to innovate on? Maybe they'll release them and something else, you know, goes, oh wow, that really is great. And then three, I'm just rambling at this point, why couldn't they make something people actually want, like a Wi-Fi mesh router system that doesn't suck? Bring back the airport, baby. Anyway, leave your predictions for Apple this year in the comments down below. What are we going to see? What might we not see that everyone thinks we're going to? And what is your favorite Apple product that you're using on the daily? Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like. If you hated it, send it to someone you hate. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please subscribe for more content. And as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.